All right, I think we'll get going. So first of all, thanks everyone for coming to the panel today. My name is Patrick Hertzke, very happy to be moderating from uh, McKinsey and Company. And I've been a part of Road Freight Zero, which is also a broader part of Mission Possible at the forum for about 18 months, uh, working closely with uh, Angie and Margie on what has really turned into quite a vibrant uh, community and and really an initiative, uh, at least in, in our view, that's really starting to take uh, take shape and also really accelerate, not, kind of in line with the industry. Um, just for those of you unfamiliar, you know, the Road Freight Zero was really set out to do two things broadly. One is think about how do we set the pace? How do we drive uh, real action? How do we spur both industry but also policymakers to action that are that are coinciding together? And also really thinking about how to accelerate not only in theory but in practice. And so working hand in hand across the value chain, sponsoring pilots of real zero emission trucks. Um, initially, Z Road Freight Zero has started as a European initiative, but is now expanding in, and under the broader uh, Mission Possible banner across the globe. We, we have published a few reports, which uh, you can avail uh, find via Googling and and we can uh, provide those to you offline if you need. And this is part of a broader ecosystem. So we, we don't want to forget that there are many hard to abate sectors. Um, I'm a big fan of trucks, so I like talking about road freight. But there are many people here, uh, obviously, at Davos uh, throughout the week that are focused on, on other aspects. And what we have coming up, just as a bit of a preview, uh, because this is an ongoing initiative and we have a number of things coming to pay attention to. We'll have another report coming out later this year. We'll also have published publicly a set of models that can actually be manipulated and used to really think about different pathways towards net zero. And so this is a bit of a preview of some 10 truths or 10 critical insights around that pathway, both you know, where are we today, the overall challenge, what is the pathway, what are some of the challenges. Um, I'll, I'll leave it up, but I, but I actually want to really kind of kick it off um, to the panel. And so I'm, I'm going to invite uh, the panelists themselves to introduce uh, uh, themselves. I always think that's more authentic. Uh, Thomas, you want to kick it off? Absolutely. Well, thank you, everyone, for attending. My name is Thomas Healy, and I'm the founder and CEO of Hylion. And Hylion is producing electrified commercial vehicles. Uh, so ultimately, I think everyone agrees electrification is happening in the commercial vehicle space. Uh, it's not a if it's going to happen, it's a more of a how it's going to happen. And the reality is, is electrifying big class eight semi trucks is extremely difficult. It is not easy. Commercial vehicles or passenger cars is much, much easier to you know, do a battery, charge it in your garage, drive a couple of hundred miles. That works. When you have to haul 80,000 pounds, it's a totally new equation. And what our focus is, is actually on long haul trucking. So the trucks that are driving five, 600 miles every single day. And this is actually the toughest part of the industry to electrify because you would need a massive, massive battery pack in order to be able to drive a vehicle that long. So our approach is, well, why don't we actually just use a small battery, but we'll bring the power plant on board the vehicle and we'll charge the batteries as you're driving down the road. And so now you can get a vehicle that is fully electric but yet has a thousand miles of range, doesn't lose a ton of payload capacity because you have a massive battery. So that's our approach. And uh, to start, we're using natural gas and renewable natural gas as our fuel source to charge the batteries, and then eventually evolve into hydrogen once the hydrogen infrastructure is built out. Um, so great to be here, and thank you all for being here. My name is Essel Sadeh. Um, I'm, my background is actually in the in 22 years in the logistics industry, building up a company to, do, to offer global supply chain solutions. So usually I would be buying trucks. Uh, recently moved over to a, an EV startup, uh, commercial vehicles, um, and now producing trucks. Ultimately, will be producing trucks uh, or commercial commercial trucks for the, what we call the mid-duty segment. Um, so, but just a little bit about our, the company Volta Trucks. Um, so we, you know, we're solving for three uh, problems, what we call three S's, um, sustainability, uh, s safety, and uh, sh shortage of drivers, which is typical in our industry. 
Uh, we're doing that by, by addressing or offering two solutions. One is the product itself, the truck, which is a reimagined truck uh, compared to most of our competitors where they convert existing designs uh, to, to, to electric. But we're doing it for this mid-duty, what we call return to base, so not the long haul. Uh, in, th in that sense, battery is what we believe is ideal, the ideal solution. That's kind of the first part of our solution is the product, and the second part is the service that needs to come with it, which is the charging infrastructure, the servicing, and the technology that you need to add value to the fleet operators. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, what we do and, and how we're going about it. And in a nutshell, uh, my name is uh, René Falke Olsen. I represent a company called DSV. So what uh, ESA built up for, for many years in, uh, as part of Agility, uh, we took over uh, about six months ago. Uh, so we are closely linked, so he knows everything about my business as well, which is unfortunate when he tries selling trucks. <laughs> uh, but uh, we'll be the, uh, the guys that have to find a way of actually occupying uh, these trucks, whatever the technology is, uh, DSV have to find a way of getting them on the road. And uh, typically, our industry is a, uh, we are light, uh, asset light organization, which means we don't have the trucks. So 95% uh, plus of our trucks on the road, and in Europe we have about 20,000 trucks on the road every day, 95% uh, of those are via subcontractors. And subcontractors, uh, not in large subcontractors with hundreds or thousands of vehicles, but uh, small subcontractors, typically anywhere from one to 10, and then a few big ones as well. That's one of the big dilemmas we have is how do we make the change? Whatever the uh, chosen technology is or the right technology is, how do we make that uh, change in an industry like that with very few barriers to entry as well? So that's in a nutshell me. Uh, we'll give you the answer shortly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you all for coming to the panel and, and thank you to the WEF for, for hosting. So the way we'll run this, I'm gonna kick it off with a, a few burning questions for our three panelists here. Um, we'll go into a few kind of open topics here, and then we'd really like to invite the audience for some Q&A as well. Um, in, no, in no particular order, just because you're uh, to the left of me. Uh, Thomas, we're, we're going to hit, you know, go right into a potential controversial topic, because Road Freight Zero was in, is and was set up as a view to how do we get to true zero emission trucks on the road worldwide driven by green electricity or other sources. But when we think about the transition period we're in right now, what do you see as the role of biofuels or e-fuels? And how do we avoid this dilemma between if we go too far in that direction, do we risk the long-term investment in the ultimately full net zero solution? And vice versa, how do we avoid the, the perfect as the enemy of the good? So I think ultimately uh, we all agree the Euphoria solution is a hydrogen-based future for the long-haul trucking. Uh, and what we, we see... We do. All right. Well, yeah, no, and we okay. do as well. So that is the, the long term of where we're going. And we've, we've actually laid a roadmap as a company of we'll evolve into a hydrogen fuel cell into the truck. Mm -hmm. uh, we've even added a, a step in that journey of having a fuel agnostic generator that can run on natural gas or hydrogen. So really enabling that future-proofing of a fleet to be able to move into hydrogen. But the reality is, is these future solutions aren't here today. I mean, hydrogen, not many people want to hear this, but it's the fuel that's been a decade away for the last 30 years. And so when is this transition going to actually happen? And from my standpoint, I don't think, you know, well, one, for our shareholders, I don't want to build a company that I'm reliant on others, building out hydrogen stations, uh, bringing the cost of hydrogen down, figuring out how to make green hydrogen. Another unspoken about thing is 95% of the hydrogen produced in the U.S., sold in the U.S., is dirty hydrogen. It's not green hydrogen. And from what research shows, most dirty hydrogen is actually more pollutive than running a diesel truck. So are you actually helping if you're going to do make a jump into these, all, these new fuels too quickly when it's not really sustainable yet? Or you can leverage renewable fuels like renewable natural gas has the ability to be net carbon negative. So that means it's actually better for the environment to drive your truck down the highway as opposed to not drive it at all, which is fascinating. It's weird to think about. But that's some of the opportunities ahead of us. And we should take advantage of those today and then evolve with the fuel technology to get into you know hydrogen when the time is right. 
and I'd, I'd invite other panelists. You feel free to jump in. Essa, is, is hydrogen the future of trucks? I don't, I don't know. I don't want to bet on the future in that sense. I want to bet on what we need to solve for today. Uh, and that's why our whole business strategy is to provide uh, trucks uh, at speed and at scale uh, to solve for what we, you know, providing sustainable cities. Uh, in that current use case, the opportunity is, is, is available, the technology is available. Uh, what's not available is the capacity to produce those trucks at scale. Uh, and that's why we, we, we work with partners to develop a, a reimagined truck, solving for the sustainability piece. But also, we have to be creative with the safety piece. Today in urban cities, trucks are about 4% of the traffic, uh, especially in cities like London, but represent 80% of the fatal biking accidents in, in, in an urban setting. So that's an opportunity, you know, an opportunity and a societal cost that we think we'll help address by offering a truck that's reimagined with a truck driver um, having wide visibility in an urban setting at passenger or pedestrian height, sitting at pedestrian height. And that's the opportunity where we think you need reimagination uh, and investments to uh, in the in the production, in the design and production of such such mm -hmm. technology. So, and I think. Uh, if we do that and we're successful, I think it creates more uh, desire for further investment uh, to build on that success. So I think hopefully by, by just being successful, we hope create other opportunities for others. And Renee, we were just talking a moment ago about the challenge in a way, both of the long term, but even the short term uh, with biofuels in that we've gone from one fuel, predominantly diesel, and now across different markets, there might be biomethane available in the U.S. In some, some parts, there might be HVO in different parts of Europe. Uh, there might not be in other areas. There, there are other e-fuels being promoted, other biodiesel options. So how do you sort of manage all of that complexity? Or how do you think of, is it market by market? Is it you're just going to take it as it comes? And what, what's available, you do the best you can, you know? Yeah, I, th I think when you have isolated lanes that you're running, then you can do it market by market as well. So we have uh, HVO that we are using in Sweden, for instance, uh, and that works really well. But it wouldn't work really well if we want to go to the southern tip of, uh, of, of Spain from, uh, from Sweden. So we have to look at the alternative versions, and it's, it's clear from our uh, perspective, if we could find a universal model that works, that is completely clean and works for everything, that would be the ideal uh, scenario. We just don't believe that that universal model exists. Uh, so, so we have to look a little bit market by market, and then we have to, I believe, look continent by continent as well, and then you'll find different solutions that fits, uh, fits it. And, and, and you know, uh, renewable energy is also bigger in certain areas than others. Uh, it's got more press uh, uh, in that way as well. So I think that will impact on it as well. Legis legislation will be a big part of uh, what we are trying to do as well, I believe. And so let me bring us back to electric trucks for a moment. There's continues to be a pretty strong view across many fleets, at least that we interface with and talk with, that these are not yet affordable solutions. Even on a TCO basis, many are not in the money, so to speak, yet. You know, is, is that incorrect? How should we think about that? And or should transporters or end customers be willing to pay more for greener shipment of goods? Uh, it answers both, right? I, I think it, it is competitive today on a TCO basis uh, over a period of time in some, with subsidies. Um, I think not only is competitive, it adds advantages of around 10, well, based on our estimates, around 10 to 15 percent lower cost compared to an internal combustion engine. Uh, for example, in the city of London, uh, it's not a subsidy, but a tax that applies to the, the internal combustion engine uh, ecosystem, but doesn't apply to a zero emission uh, truck. And that's, that's typically around you know, 10 to 15 percent more cost than they would have to pay with a zero emission truck. Um, and, and without it, we we're, were almost at parity. And I think companies like us will work towards T TCO parity within the next year, you know, two years, by 2020, 2025. Um, so that's one thing. That, it's competitive today with subsidies, and it will be at parity without subsidies in, in a couple of years. But nevertheless, there is a, an opportunity for, I, I heard this term, and I, I, I thought it was a great term, is there is a little bit of a, a, an eco-inflation that companies need to pay. You know, we're, we're paying it today, given the current situation. 
why not pay it and re you know, realize societal benefit uh, through some form of short-term inflation? Uh, and that's the opportunity. And I think that there is an opportunity. We all have a role. Uh, we all could do better. Uh, and what we're doing as a company is trying to provide the option. Uh, and we believe as we provide that option, demand is not going to be our problem. It's really to ensure that we have enough supply. Because the use case is now, and, and we're seeing from our commercial uh, discussions, um, there's, a, there's a strong product market fit, especially what, what I call with customers that I would call early adopters that are willing to explore the journey and, and, and learn. And if I were to say, what, what is keeping me up at night is not the, the production of the truck or the technology that needed, but it's actually what we need to do to upgrade uh, the infrastructure. Uh, to support uh, a fleet of, of battery-enabled trucks. And it's not the charging itself, because that's the easy part. It's the grid that needs to go into those, uh, into, into those uh, charging stations or, or depots where we will install charging infrastructure. To, install, to upgrade the grid and or to extend the grid to those sites takes time. And that's what, what keeps me up at night at this point in time. So to, so to add to that, because just as we were coming into this room, chatting with someone, and they said, you know, I know an individual who is operating eight electric trucks in their fleet, plug-in trucks. And to charge those vehicles, they have a Caterpillar diesel engine <laughs> sitting in the parking lot that they're plugging those trucks in to charge them because the grid can't support it. And we're hearing this time and time again from fleets. Uh, massive fleets are looking at all their warehouses, and they're finding three to five trucks is all that the grid can support. Uh, there's a great study done that said, you know, the, uh, the, if you put 50 electric trucks on the grid, that's equivalent to the same amount of electricity as the entire Empire State Building consumes. So how many Empire State Buildings could we plop onto the grid? It can't happen, right? And that's the hurdles that fleets are facing right now. And I fully agree with you. We'll have electric trucks. The technology is there and it's going to evolve very quickly. We have a massive issue of how do you actually charge these vehicles? And how do you charge them fast so the fleet's going to tame uptime? And just to call, so I, I, would, I would say, and that's why in our, in our situation, where we're focused on is the use case of what we call return to base. So you, t our typical customer would uh, charge overnight, which is lower cost, uh, ideal, less, less peak time on the grid, load in the morning, do their rounds, and, and then return to base and charge overnight again. And I think that's where, where getting quick wins, create opportunities, and, and build from there. Um, also, a little bit in the European market compared to, I think, the US market, there's a lot of tailwinds. So for example, in the city of Paris, uh, it, it potentially, or not potentially, uh, they're, they're working towards a, a diesel ban in 2024. Uh, whether they stick to that deadline, I don't know, but that, that's on, on the calendar. Uh, so we have to find solutions in the short term, but I agree with you, it's, it's the, that's, that's what is keeping me up night right now. And maybe, maybe if we stay in the theme of sort of what we need to transition, right? And uh, Renee, I'll bring it back to you because you're, you're the, the customer of, of these great solutions that we're excited about in the future. But as we've just been talking about, there's real hurdles uh, in this transitionary period and, and beyond as we try to scale. Uh, to, to be on five trucks per depot to 10 or 50. Some aspects of that that uh, certainly we're also hearing increasingly this really big concern over grid upgrade and underlying costs, also the time it takes. So uh, we're finding transporters that will deploy five trucks in a pilot, then they want to scale up to 20, and they're hit with millions of dollars of grid upgrade, long time frames to get those, those upgrades, especially in an urban environment. But from your perspective, what do you see as the most urgent things that, are, that fleets need uh, right now? What's top of your list? Um, I think I said it to you before, there's a lot of chickens and there's a lot of eggs uh, involved in this one. So there's uh, the vehicles, we need the vehicles uh, to be there. Uh, we need the infrastructure, has uh, been mentioned as well. We need the, uh, the uh, supply to the, into the infrastructure as well. So there's a lot of things that actually have to fall into place. and. The, the biggest problem we probably have now is which technology is going to be the right technology for us uh, moving forward. We believe at this moment in time there's the, it's, a, it's a hybrid of, uh, f for the, uh, as SS mentioning, local deliveries on electric vehicles. We believe that's right. 
but we will have to test it. And then we will uh, no doubt find that we have more challenges than we uh, thought we had. I think Paris will find that when there's no lights in the Champs-Élysées, uh, they'll probably complain about uh, all these electric vehicles. Um, but it, it's going to be a challenge uh, moving forward. I think when we look at it, the investments we are making in, in all our new sites uh, is also looking forward to this uh, power generation on the sites as well. We're building a new facility in Denmark. It's got 325,000 square meters of solar panels on there to be able to capture uh, energy and maybe produce some of the energy we need. I don't know whether that's, uh, that's enough, and it depends on obviously how many vehicles. But I think that's what drives it. And then uh, the, the biggest challenge I believe we're going to get is how do we get it into the, uh, into the system? How do we get the subcontractors to move in the direction we want them to move in? So I think, uh, as I know, uh, have got uh, models for the financing for the subcontractors as well, which I believe are extraordinarily important because else it's not going to happen. Yeah. And what also, uh, back to the carbon uh, credits or carbon taxes or whatever you want to call them, I, it doesn't really, as long as it works, it doesn't matter whether it's one or the other. Uh, I would rather have penalties than actually uh, get incentives, in, in my opinion, because I think it drives fundamentally the right behavior moving forward as well. Right. You can take those penalties. Uh, you don't need to eliminate them at the end because nobody sure. will be paying them. Sure. Um, that was what happens with the congestion charge originally in the UK as well. Right. Either you get a load of cash, uh, which was for the mayor, or you get rid of the pollution. So it's happy days. He can never lose, you know. Uh, so he could always claim a success. So I think it's important that we find a model um, where we can convince the subcontractors to go in whatever direction we need them to go in. Because otherwise, you know, we can do it. We are two to three percent of the market in Europe. And we do it, and we are uncompetitive. And then tomorrow, somebody else will driving it, uh, be driving the diesel truck that we, uh, we, we didn't want to drive. Mm. So we have to be careful that it's still competitive at the end of the day. I mean, maybe, Esa, Thomas, you want to speak to a little bit how, how are truck makers now having to be solution providers on the financing side, on the infra, energy, and that probably goes even with, in both of your cases. Um, you know, how do you see that going forward? And, and what do you think the right models are? Yeah, so I'll start it off. And um, so it's changing fast. I mean, the trucking industry, frankly, if you think about it, we're, it's kind of been spoiled for a while where there's a one size fits all solution. It's diesel, right? That's where we are today. And as we make this shift into electric, it's not a one size fits all. And I think what you're hearing from all of us is don't try to fit a square peg in a round hole, right? Don't, I don't, you know, Esso's not sitting up here saying, take his plug in electric trucks and go drive 500 miles. No, he's saying, find the right solutions and, you know, implement the truck in that area. Similar to us, we're saying, hey, we're long haul. We're vehicles that are going over the road. Then is when you bring forward these electric solutions, it opens up, you know, a lot else that needs to be figured out, right? Uh, you know, the charging infrastructure, I think many OEMs, and I, I don't know if Volt is, but you, you can comment on this in a second, is they're having to come forward and say, I'm not only going to provide you trucks, I'm going to lay out the roadmap for you of how you're going to build these charging pedestals in the parking lot as well, or hopefully not find the Caterpillar diesel engine in the parking lot as well, because that's not helping the environment. But uh, so they're having to do that. We're seeing financing being a big point of discussion, because going back to the uh, the discussion earlier about this has to make economical sense. Ultimately, I haven't seen an electric vehicle that's costing less than a diesel truck. These things are going to cost more. It's just the reality of where we are today. You need to then address how is your operating cost going to change though, right? So ultimately, if for I'll give you our example, you know, yes, it's a higher upfront cost vehicle, but we're using a fuel that's about a dollar per gallon. So when you compare that against four or five dollar diesel right now, it can make a very fast payback for fleet. So you need to bring forward, you are going to bring forward a solution that costs more on the upfront, but then hopefully it's going to have lower operating costs over time to drive it down. And then if you do unique financing models, then if you can structure it where it's cost less than operating a diesel truck, I don't know why DSV wouldn't buy them. <laughs> we would. <laughs> <laughs> we I mean, might even become a whole, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say three things in, in, kind of in the context of this question and, and some of the feedback. Um, the question is, what's at stake for us, and uh, and wh why we're offering what we're offering, uh, and if if we all have the same diagnosis of the issue and the and the potential of what's at stake for us, then the problem will be solved. Because if there's a will, there's got to be a way, right? And we'll, we we've done as a society grander things than than what we're trying to solve 
right now in the short term. That's kind of number one. Number two, uh, I was in, related to that, I was in a session earlier with a few utility companies and in discussing, in discussing or in our discussion around the upgrade of the grid and what they need to do, one of the questions they, w they were responding to or the response they were giving is, if you bring us the demand, we'll do it. And to me, that was, felt like more of an excuse rather than, uh, <laughs> than, than a real challenge. And I, and I told them, look, we've raised 300 million. There's plenty of demand and it's coming. Uh, you know, and that's kind of what I say, I think we're providing is solutions today, not, not, not tomorrow. And therefore, eliminating this question of bring a, there's no demand for us to, to upgrade to the, the grid to meet the, uh, the solutions that we're, we're providing. So that's kind of number two, I would say. And number three, data that supports the business case. Uh, we, just si or we just signed a heads of terms with a financing company where they're gonna provide our customers uh, up to 250 million euros of, of financing to support their investments in trucks, in our trucks. Um, and they're doing that knowing f that there is gonna be residual value risk. There's, they know, know that there's gonna be uh, battery life issues and they're willing to take on that risk. So that's my point. There are solutions today. If there's a will, there, there is a way. Um, if we all agree on what's at stake and that's probably what I, I know how I would frame what you know, this is conversation and maybe just uh, continuing on the on the point and maybe going back Rene I, I thought you uh, hit on a, a critical topic it's it, it's especially problematic here in Europe but exists in many other places which is you know if you look at any of the major transport and logistics companies yourself included maybe five ten max 15 percent of the fleets are typically owned the rest are all third-party logistics subcontracted. That could be Bob's trucks with five trucks. That could be a pretty you know, sophisticated operation with several hundred, many of which are not nearly as capitalized as you might be or as you know, other, other entities, uh, nor do they necessarily have the same um, expectations or pressures or interests to decarbonize. It's not that they don't want to do the right thing, but they they're trying to move trucks and freight every day, and they're trying to make on a, oftentimes a relatively modest margin. So, you know, I, I just opened it up actually to anyone on the panel, really, as we think about this, because Essa, you mentioned, you know, the financing and providing the financing, some level of trading CapEx for OpEx, um, pulling the payback forward, that's one aspect of it, providing that solutioning of getting the infrastructure installed at their depot for them, in a way that helps them transition. Um, but there's probably gonna be some resistance uh, as well. So I don't know if you, I don't know if we'll have the solutions here, but very, very open, to, maybe we'll try to solve it. We'll try so, to solve it. So have you driven an electric truck? I've driven an electric truck, yes. And once you put a driver in them, they love them. They do. They are unbelievable. So that's gonna be the first selling point, but I'll let, I'll let you take it. Yeah, then you need a driver to get into it as well, because that's the other problem that we all face with. So autonomous would solve it as well. It would solve a lot, in my opinion. Uh, but I think, um, you know, the way we need to solve it is somehow it has to be, there has to be a financial uh, burden involved in not doing the right thing. If we are all serious about solving the problem, then we also have to, over time, ensure that it becomes attractive to solve the problem as well. So if I give you an example, the, the taxi industry in Copenhagen, if you look, if you go to Copenhagen now compared to going to Copenhagen two years ago, n so many of the taxis there are electric vehicles, battery electric uh, vehicles, very few hybrid as well, because they've made decisions already now. What's going to happen in 2025? What's going to happen in 2030? And I believe in 2030, even if you have a, a taxi, you will not get a license to drive it. So what, what's happening now is they're actually moving uh, moving the industry forward and that's something like that that we need to do as an industry in the uh, in the heavy goods transportation as well we need to so uh, do something like that because otherwise somebody will find a way of making more money uh, and being less green than uh, than they should be so i think it is really uh, either the penalizing or incentivizing uh, either model would work but over time uh, and then eventually it will be the tco will be better uh, doing the right thing anyway and then it doesn't matter uh, you know so I, th I think that's the way we have to do it if we did that 
we would very quickly, we are, although we don't have the trucks, you know, we do actually command 20,000 trucks every day in Europe. We will make the uh, demands on those guys to say, this is the type of truck I will accept, this is the one I won't accept. Uh, that's our decision to make. And, and then people will get out of the industry. But we have to be ma mindful of the fact that it's not really uh, hauliers with uh, a few trucks are not making a lot of money as well. So we have to, we have to help them along. Help them and push them and kick them sometimes as well. So I think there's a, a kind of um, unique situation here that I've seen where if you think about the general public and how much electric trucks are being talked about, I think most general public thinks there are tons of electric trucks out there. They're getting adopted. They're out there already happening. That's not the reality. We're dealing with like prototypes on the road right now. I mean, that's the reality of where electric trucks are. And then you look at the fleets and they're all saying, I want this. I'm ready to adopt it. I'm ready to try it. Like, you know, the, the trucks I have driven in are fantastic. We're ready. And then you're dealing with the suppliers, like Essa and I, and we're like, we're working as fast as we can to get this thing done and get it out there, get it validated, get it in your hands. Like, so there's this big uh, divergence of kind of where people think things are at and where the supply base is truly at. Um, you know, we're, we're still finding, you know, components we source from major parts pr uh, producers that we find issues in their components, right? I mean, that's just the reality of where electric components are today. Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, no, I, I, I think it is uh, what we're seeing. I think uh, what I am seeing uh, also is a significant amount of investment going in. A couple of our main suppliers, uh, take Meritor, for example, who produce uh, kind of what we call the e-axle, which is combining the, that, you know, the axle motor into one unit plus the software that goes with it. Um, they've been bought out by Cummins f solely for their uh, electrification journey, and, and now they're making a further investment into that. Um, and that, so I, I, w I would agree, and that's where the opportunity is, and that's why companies like us have taken, you know, you know, kind of narrowly focused our product range into one product next next year, first quarter next year to come to, full, you know, job one, start of production. We've done our prototypes. We have a few more prototypes to come out this year, um, but really, job one or start of production at scale starts in the first quarter next year. Um, working with the partners who are really committed to now put, uh, ensure the supply of all those integrated technology with one product, narrowly focused. Because if, if we dilute ourselves too much, we will fail. To, and and there, there is a lot of skepticism uh, around supply, around some of the EV uh, companies that are out there, uh, and, and, and rightly so. And that's why for us, n narrow focus, get to market uh, with a credible product that meets the, the promise of what we're offering, which the prototype suggests that we will meet the, the promise we're offering, uh, we're, we, you know, we're giving, um, and then iterate from there is, 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 is the pragmatic approach, and, and that's kind of our philosophies, to really be focused, not, not over hype, get to, the <laughs> get to market at scale, um, and then, but the, I think to back to your question, Patrick, um, what we're having to do uh, is not only offer the truck, but offer the gas station. <laughs> in, in parallel to, which is what you don't see in the, in the current ecosystem. So this is a shift in the ecosystem that has to happen in the short term uh, to make, make it easy for you, uh, de-risk it for you, uh, not, not to invest in the trucks that we're providing and then not have the uptime that you would expect for a truck like ours. Uh, and that's why I think the combination you know, of our, our offering is, in our use case, it's, short ter it's, not, it's available in the short term, will be available in the short term, in a use case that's ready and primed for, for an opportunity. And then for the long haul, it, it, I mean, if you wait for the full infrastructure that you would need, you, you never get there, or it takes mm. a long time. And that's why I think uh, your solution sound, sounds, is, is critical uh, to address the, the diagnosis. Do we believe that, you know, are we aligned at what at stake? And I think that, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's an iterative step to get there, which is a zero emission ecosystem by whatever year you, you, you want to achieve it. And Rene, I'll go, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, and I, th I think one of the important things also here is that we are grown-ups, you know, we want to solve the problem. So even if it costs us a little bit of money, and that's one of the, we provide a playground for these guys to come with the products, and we actually put them into a real-life situation, we actually get all the experience, or you also get the, we share it, get the experience of what does it actually mean? You know, will it work? Uh, as Thomas said, uh, I've got an electric vehicle myself, I absolutely love it. 
I was skeptical to start with, but I love it. It's the best thing ever. And I'm sure the truck drivers will have exactly the same uh, experience. They'll definitely, the good-looking truck, in, you know, best-looking truck in the world, comes from uh, ESA as well. Thank you. It's, uh, I never thought I'd say this, but uh, <laughs> I did. I just did. Sounds weird. Uh, <laughs> but I, uh, I think we will have the playground. We will get the experience. And even if it costs us money, I think it's also about proving that you can get to net zero. And then, then it, it, it will start, it, it will just uh, continue after that, but we have to prove it. And that also comes back to the energy we consume has to be the right, right type of energy as well. You know, this is vitally important because otherwise the PR will be so negative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's enough people out there, by the way, uh, very busy telling you that an EV is not good and da da da. Uh, I've heard a lot of that. So, uh. so I'm going to pick up on a couple points you made there, uh, Renee. So one you mentioned or you alluded to a moment ago, driver shortage, and which is a challenge in Europe, US, other places as well. I would argue the one role that's going to be more difficult than hiring a driver is hiring a high voltage certified technician. Yeah. And I had a uh, quite an ironic experience as someone that talks about EVs and works on EVs and drives EVs that this week before I came to Davos, my EV died on the side of the road on the way to dropping the kids off at school, and which is pretty rare, admittedly. I won't say which manufacturer makes the EV, uh, but you know, and, and it's a software issue, right? So it's, a, it's an entirely different type of maintenance and service envelope and, and sort of world that we're in now. And so, uh, you know, just curious on, on your view on are we ready? Do we have the solutions um, in place? And how, as, as these, even though we're rolling out maybe in pilot level, how do we very quickly get ready to support these vehicles in the field? Because if they're not, if there's more downtime, if there's more issues, then fleets are going to be uh, upset and you know, adopt more slowly, perhaps. Yeah, well, it's quite funny because uh, when you get your first EV, you sort of accept it. Yeah? It, it, it happens, and uh, it's, an ex it's part of the experience as well. That certain things happen, and uh, it's all about software. They can't connect to the car. So I think we will accept it in order to get the learnings. Uh, but I think uh, Esa also mentioned it, yeah. he will provide a guarantee of the uptime as well, and that becomes important. So, so what does the guarantee consist of yeah. at the end of the day? Uh, that, that's the, the product has to secure that it actually is there and is available. And if there's a bad experience, it goes back to the product. Uh, yes, we will have issues with, uh, but it'll, you know, in freight forwarding, we need excuses as well. You know, this will be brilliant. You know, <laughs> there was no electricity, so we couldn't do it. It's the grid's, uh, grid's fault. It wasn't a puncture. You know? <laughs> it's <just> great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's a, it's a, an ob a problem that we have to solve for, for sure, uh, and which is the, 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 the skill set. Uh, shifts from what, you know, kind of what you have to provide in, in the internal combustion engine to zero emission or battery uh, plugins. Uh, you need the uh, high volt technicians. Um, our approach, again, in terms of pragmatic, pragmatic approach towards an ambitious goal, is to focus on the city by city rollout. And this is where, in each city, you provide a solution to ensure that you're able to uh, respond uh, to meet the uptime requirements. Uh, uh, of, of, of companies like yourself uh, to respond, build the capabilities, build the, the skill set, build the information set or the data uh, as to what could be the, the sizing and scoping of that service needs uh, in that situation. Um, that's the only way to get there. I mean, it, you have to iterate. And that's why most of our customers are what I would call early adopters. They're willing to go through that journey and learn uh, and, and experience that uh, build the muscle about understanding what to do, what you need to do to operate a, a zero emission fleet. So and I, I absolutely agree with you. The drivers love the truck when they start driving an electric vehicle, um, but they still need to evolve also on how to drive it, not simply just steering, you know, not just steering and pressing on the, gas or the pedal and the, and the brakes. There are uh, factors that they have, to, they have to learn also. So it's a, it's a journey uh, that we have to go through. So you're not the only one that's had to get towed, but uh, there's a, a fleet we know that um, is operating a handful of uh, BEV trucks in their operations, and they were telling us how they have a tow truck on standby 24-7 to go pick up the BEV trucks when they die, when they run out of battery, because the drivers uh, aren't getting them back to get them recharged in time, or they try to drive too far. And so I think to that point, there's going to be a playground here for a little while where fleets are willing to put up with that to, you know, 
pickup trucks that run out of battery charge, but that's not going to last forever, right? I mean, that's it's it's something that you know the, we are going to have to make this realistic and practical and actually work in the operations. Uh, similarly, you brought up on the maintenance side, so. Um, the approach we've taken is the system is very modular, uh, so you can disconnect all the high voltage with uh, it's called power distribution block, you know, or a, uh, a power distribution disconnect. You can take that out, contains all the high voltage in the battery pack, and then you can do modular replacements of components uh, on the truck. Because the reality is, we're not going to train up a bunch of you know service technicians overnight on electrification and get every service shop in the in the US or across the world to have high voltage gloves and all these things, right? That's not gonna happen. So uh, you need to design the system with those kind of hurdles in mind so that uh, you can make it practical where you know you give someone instruction of, hey, you're gonna take this whole box off and then bolt a new one on, put the you know power distribution block back in and now you're, uh, you're high voltage again. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, we'll ask maybe one or two other topics and then would love to open to the audience here as well. Um, Renee, if I go back to you just as a global transporter logistics company, we often talk about this trend in a very westernized way. We talk about Europe, we talk about Western Europe, especially we talk about the U.S. Um, you know, what is, you know, in, in, your, in, in the view of the group, is this constrained to be, for the next 10 years even, let's, let's just limit it to this time frame, to be a Western Europe, uh, U.S. trend, or plus, plus Japan, Korea, China, et cetera? Or, you know, can it go to, can we find solutions to go to India, Indonesia, Nigeria, um, uh, Brazil, other places, or what would have to be true for us to drive this other places? I think there's many places where it would actually, they're probably more ready uh, and able to change. If you look at China, the space with, uh, space with, uh, with which they can change their infrastructure, their roads, uh, any charging networks, etc. So they're a lot faster uh, than we traditionally are, at least in Europe, where there's loads of, uh, you know, you need to jump into a lot of hoops and get out of them again uh, in order to do something. So I, I don't think it's restricted uh, to what we do. I think we're missing a point a little bit when we have the dialogue, because we always talk about trucks on the road and how we can make them more efficient. There's two elements that we look at uh, every day, and that's the utilization of the trucks. Uh, and we, I think it was mentioned by somebody yesterday also, if you look at the uh, utilization of containers. We have a massive issue with the, in the container industry with uh, congestion, et cetera, et cetera. But if you had a window on the side of each container, you would see that on average they're filled to about 60%. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things we can do with the same emissions than what we do today. So if you can actually improve uh, the optimization of networks, uh, eliminate uh, empty kilometers as well, I think that's, uh, if you look at the, uh, uh, in Europe, that's a big problem. It's a lot of kilometers. Uh, if you can penalize them, then you get people to collaborate better. And maybe the uh, EU should think about the mobility package as well, where we are driving trucks in the wrong direction for no purpose other than, uh, uh, than taxes. Uh, I don't see any sense in that at all. It's not good for the environment. You have to find smarter solutions to, uh, to these things. So I think there's a lot of things that we can do, but I don't think it's uh, limited to, uh, to Europe. Um, and I think it's positive that other countries would be even, even more ready and able to take it on uh, quicker than we are. Uh, we'd love to open, open questions, yes. Thank you, I'm Philippe Monnier from Switzerland. I represent several companies, including a, a young company called Wayray. I have a question both to Essa and Thomas. Um, Essa, you said that one of the three problems you're trying to solve, the three S, is scarcity of drivers. Do you believe in remote driving to have, let's say, drivers India, in India, uh, driving uh, trucks, I don't know, in the UK, uh, thanks to technology? Um, I, 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 I think you're referring to autonomous, kind of an autonomous uh, vehicle. But like a drone, uh, yeah. Um, do I believe in that? Uh, I don't know. I've never seen. <laughs> I don't know if I would say I believe in it, but I think there are solutions, with, in, in particular on autonomous uh, vehicles. Uh, but in the use case that we're solving for in, the, in an urban setting, I think that's premature right now. But in, in maybe in the, in the longer haul, there, there, probably, there probably are opportunities uh, for that. Um, and, and that's why we're solving for the problem here and now. Uh, and that's why we, we look at uh, um, how could we widen the population of potential drivers. 
uh, and right now, if you look at the statistics, it's a certain segment of drivers that are in the trucks. Um, and with our reimagined truck, kind of wide visibility, open cab, uh, much less uh, challenging and, and intimidating, I think we can widen the population of drivers uh, for, for in an urban setting. So I think autonomous driving or remote driving is going to be a thing. I actually fall more on the belief of autonomous driving from a standpoint of I wholeheartedly believe that uh, the technology will be there way before the regulations allow it to actually be widely adopted and utilized. And so from that standpoint, I think uh, autonomous trucks will be, uh, will be th there first. But uh, I fully agree with what Essa just said of the long haul space is where you want to adopt those, not in the city, right? There's so many m new hurdles that come up when you go into city applications. But when you think about an autonomous truck, it's all about you'd asset utilization, keeping that truck running 24 seven, right? That's how you get the most out of it. That's not notorious for being good for BEVs, right? And we actually see our technology couple extremely well with autonomous because we can refuel the vehicle in about 10 minutes and give you another thousand miles of range In 10 minutes, thousand miles of range. So from that standpoint, that really leverages asset utilization and uptime. Question in the back. Yes, hi, I'm David. I co-founded Senda, the largest digital road trade forwarder here in Europe. And what we've been discussing today is what motivates me to you know, spend at least the next 10 years uh, in this industry. It's not going to be our, the next generation or the following that will experience this change, uh, but it's us. So over the past couple of uh, months, I have uh, spent some time with the big traditional OEMs discussing paper use model, associating guaranteed utilization with a green premium and so on to distribute that. And what I realize is that they understand that the change is coming. They don't know yet how to execute it. But if I hear at you, listen at you, it feels like the technical solution and the focus, Thomas, you're the technical solution and you more the focus, is a complete game changer. And that in five years, they would be out of business. So my question is, why don't we have anyone here today from these big truck manufacturers to you know, at least listen, understand if the solution is so superior than what they're working on. So I'll start with that. The S is a little bit different. So, uh, but our approach is actually to not build the full vehicle. We actually work with the conventional vehicle makers to build the chassis, and then we build the powertrain that goes into it. And so we're launching the product on the Peterbilt uh, vehicle owned by Packard. Uh, fantastic truck. That'll be you know. So when you see the truck, it's going to look like you know, a Peterbilt driving down the road, a truck that fleets know and they really like, uh, but yet it's going to have electrification. One of our philosophies, as a, you know, as companies taking a different approach for good reason on the safety side, but one of our philosophies is you don't need to reinvent the semi truck in order to get electrification. You just need a new powertrain in the truck. And so that's the approach we're going. And it's actually enabling the conventional OEMs that you talk about to have a long haul solution with our powertrain in it. I, I mean, it'd be always great, and I, I think there are the other OEMs are they're, they're thinking about it. But I would ask, you know, where the incentives lie today, uh, and, and I, I think it's in they make all their money from diesel. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's probably the best answer I could give you. Hi, uh, Gary Brown from U.S. Two questions here. One, as, uh, the question I'm asking is kind of, even if you can build a thousand vehicles a year. 10,000 vehicles a year. Who is going to be responsible? Is this the government coming to you, or do you have to come up with the package to show how you're going to be able to change the grid so you can charge these? That's one. For you, you're going to make the long haulers. you got a problem with hydrogen being clean, for one, to be green. Two, to have service centers all over the U.S. Right now, you can hardly, in the U.S., find a place to get propane, or, you know, for, for uh, propane cars or whatever. So the question is, these are becoming regulations in everywhere. The governments want all this. Whose responsibility is it to get the infrastructure set up so you can supply that truck and you can supply this truck for a small city? So, great question. The beauty of our use case is we don't need to deploy uh, charging infrastructure in, in a big way. Where we need it is in, at the warehouse or the depot of the, our, our customer. It's only at one location, because the range that we've designed our truck to cover is more than enough for the typical routes that they would cover, which is around 60, 70, 80 kilometers. So it's, it's a one location charging infrastructure, which is a small 
premium uh, above the truck price. So we don't want the government involved in that necessarily. What, what we do need is in, a, in a, many locations we will be able to upgrade or they already have capacity, so it's not a problem. There are a bigger, there's a big subset that, that you, we need to extend the, the power to, or you know, improve the power, increase the power to the location. And that's where the utilities need to extend their grid. And that takes time. There's a little, there, I, would, I, would I would argue there's too much regulation yeah, right. uh, that, that is impacting. And that's where we, that's where we're <laughs> advocating. What can we do to speed that up? Uh, and that's, uh, that's the issue uh, that, that, that keeps me up at night. And then for the long haul, as you mentioned, hydrogen, right? There's, there's a lot that needs to happen in hydrogen stations. Cost needs to come down and green hydrogen needs to be produced, right? And that's where our whole pitch is, let's not start with hydrogen. Let's start with renewable natural gas, natural gas. The stations are already there. They're already built out. Service centers are already trained up on natural gas across the U.S. Uh, it's already in place. And so it's like, it's already set up all there for us. Let's just utilize it. Emissions benefits are fantastic. This actually opens up a topic we haven't necessarily spoken about is, there's so much of a drive, like the regulatory issue we see is there's so much of a drive for zero tailpipe emissions. But that philosophy kind of promotes the, well, I don't want it to come out of the tailpipe of the truck, but I'm fine with turning on a coal-fired power plant to charge this truck. I, personally, I don't think that makes sense, right? Uh, so that's where I see some of the, my frustrations with regulations that are coming out is just trying to move emissions elsewhere. But maybe, maybe just one additional comment. I mean, across the two, from some other things that we're seeing. I think the the issue around grid investment is now becoming a paramount topic. And I think it is one that is not fully appreciated yet by policymakers, but it's starting to penetrate because industry is starting to understand that. And especially those that are trying, as you mentioned, to run not just five pilot electric trucks, but you know, 10, 20 heavy electric trucks and then trying to charge those overnight and then experiencing the pain of having to then try to get the, the, the cost and the grid upgraded. We have clients that are looking, whether it's in the bus or truck space, to move depots to locations that have better grid connections. It's an entirely different mindset that we would never imagine before. Um, and I think it's one of these things that it's probably a great debate, but maybe at the end we'll, we'll touch on policy you know, mindsets and, and, and levers. But uh, you know, it's effectively, it, it's, it's hard to argue that isn't a public good. It's hard to argue that, um, that utilities on their own will invest without being paid to do so. It's hard to pass that on to truck makers or transporters who are running, you know, certain margins and certain profiles of business. Um, and the green hydrogen one is, uh, you know, the, the potential benefit will be if these other sectors that we showed a moment ago help spur investment in green hydrogen but that doesn't that doesn't mean that we'll have build out of fill stations of green green hydrogen so we might have blue hydrogen or biofuels or biomethane fill stations which then become hydrogen fill stations over time it's a big question of where kind of big oil classic big energy companies also come to play um, if, if hydrogen becomes the next backfill for diesel um, that could help but I, I think this it's safe to assume we need more government investment <laughs> I don't know, Rene, you yeah, want to yeah, jump but, in there. Yeah, but I think it's also safe to assume that all the uh, uh, petrochemical companies, they are aware that the world is changing. Yes. So if you look at it, if you had all the forecourts in the world, uh, would you be a little bit nervous about uh, selling only diesel and, uh, and petrol at this moment in time? I would. And I think they realize the only way they get people to shop in their shops, which are typically next to the petrol station, is to get people in there. And we actually spoke to a guy yesterday from one of the uh, big companies in that sector. And he says the brilliance about electric vehicles is that if they go and charge at my place and not at home, they'll spend even more time in the shop, so I'll sell them even more products. Uh, so, so that will be a change as well. So, so I think we also have the, the appetite will be there because they will see this coming. They see it for the passenger uh, vehicles as well. They'll see it for the truck industry as well, no doubt. All right, one, maybe time for one or, one or two more quick ones. My name is Laila. I'm from Egypt. My question is about biofuels. When we decided to go that route strategically, did we sit with local communities, farmers in particular, of whom 50% are women, of that 50%, 20% are female-headed households who feed kids off of that land? Or did we sit with indigenous populations before we cut down forests to grow crops for biofuels? The energy you people have demonstrated in putting a clean 
uh, low emission vehicle on the road is admirable. But then we cut down forests and then we're in a food crisis situation. Are we still going the biofuel route? Are we going to consult local communities? That's my question. So I'm probably the closest, closest to this one. Uh, so uh, what we see as, uh, as really the trend going on in the US, which is, I think, a fantastic trend is the the renewable natural gas that I, I've been referring to has more been the capturing methane coming off of landfills, dairy farms, wastewater treatment plants. So this was pollution that was going into the atmosphere regardless. So let's capture that pollution and then let's use that as our fuel to charge our battery pack. Like to me, that's the brilliant you know path to go uh, to your comment of you know other ways to produce it. Uh, yeah, that there's some is issues there. But I think if you can capture pollution and use that as a fuel, it's brilliant. You're still going for biofuels, but a different type, though, right? It's a because it, it's um, methane the methane capture, yeah. That and that's what uh, you know we're seeing. And to put a stat to it, in the U.S. last year, over 50 percent of the fuel sold at natural gas stations already already came from uh, renewable natural gas, you know, methane capture. But but this will be a big a big debate for governments. If we just take the Paris example we talked about a moment ago. There is discussion which came about in the recent uh, run-up to the election that instead of just the diesel ban in its explicit nature, which would ban diesel and promote electric or other solutions, they might give an exemption for 100% biodiesel. And that was a bit of a nod to trying to help ease the transition for transporters who were worried or presumably worried about overnight having to shift to electric and not being ready. But those choices have knock-on effects. And uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting point, yeah. My name is Saleh Marghani from Al uh, Uliyan Group Saudi. Yeah, so one of the things that uh, we're, when we're looking at decarbonizing the, the, tra the transportation, especially we are in both sides, we're sitting on the f uh, with some ventures on freight and when we're also selling trucks, is the retrofitting for the exact reason that you said. A lot of these fleets, are owned by locals that they are subcontracting it to the to the forwarders and the big question i know i'm a mechanical engineer so that i just want to remove the ignorance from my question but the retrofitting still remains as something that we keep asking can we use existing fleets can we get people to invest on conversion rather than jumping straight to the new trucks because otherwise the cost required to, you know, to, to produce is just like the caterpillar example that you made. That will be with the steel and the tires and everything that requires to generate new trucks. Mm -hmm. The chassis remain the chassis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, for, for us, uh, we're offering. I mean, a, a, a solution. Our solution won't be to s stop all, you know, d dispose of all their fleet and then replace it with all, you know, the, the trucks that we would offer. There will be a replacement cycle. We won't have enough capacity to supply a complete replacement. Um, so there has to be a replacement cycle that will extend, you know, five, ten, up to ten years into into the future. Um, but the, the the important point for us is to be competitive and, and make it financially rewarding to them to invest in in this replacement. And we believe we're there uh, with the cost that we see of. The total, the kind of the total truck with the battery and all all the technology that comes with it, uh, the energy that you would save, um, and then over time, you know, you you would benefit over time. That 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 is, I mean, we have the models, we have the assumptions, and it's t it's demonstrated for us uh, with our customers in our use case. In in a, in a long haul, it's a different discussion. We're not we're not trying to solve that problem right now because we don't have that technology to support. What's that? Yeah. Uh, we took very narrow focus, solution, pragmatic, today, or first quarter next year. <laughs> yeah. Essa, um, I know it's going to be different market by market, but uh, do you have any range of payback periods uh, for your product? Uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, the t total cost of ownership uh, over an eight-year period is, is a 15% advantage. So if you... Uh, roughly, uh, depending on the market. Uh, so I, I, in the, I'm using this, I should be clear. In London and, and Paris, where our first city, is about a 15% advantage o over the life. So you would probably pay double the cost of the, of the truck and then save, uh, save that over an eight-year period over t you know, with a 10% advantage at the end of that. 
What are you seeing for electric costs? Uh, it it depends. I mean, it depends on the market. So it's roughly um, eleven cents, euro cents uh, a kilometer. And the cost versus a, a diesel. And the diesel is probably two, two times or three times, depending on the, on the market. I think it's, it's also an interesting question because in historical evolutions of just improved engine technology that just gets a bit better on trucks, most fleets, if it's a new technology or something coming in, they want a two-year payback or less. So if it's side skirts, if it's aerodynamic aspects, if it's other things, they want to see the money quickly. And here we're starting to see, whether it's because of the different financial models, truck as a service, different leasing and financing models, they're willing to extend that a little bit. Um, but there's still, in, in, in some models, there's concern over residual value and, and sort of what happens to the batteries and what's the risk. And so typically, and also when we talk to private equity investors or really, you know, there's a lot of money on the sidelines kind of waiting to come into the space of electrifying fleets. The biggest question is residual value. How do I protect that downside? What happens with the battery in second life? Um, and there is an interesting tie back to your, your other question too, but you know, it, it's this challenge of, we could see more retrofitting happen, but the, but the first, uh, the, you know, the virgin battery cost is so high. It makes it really, really tough. The second life battery might be possible, but then we're waiting eight, 10 years from now to first start retrofitting trucks in high volume. And so it's a really tough question on the retrofitting side of, we don't wanna wait eight years to start retrofitting trucks for purposes for um, lower, lower cost drivers and, and, and markets, but uh, we need lower cost batteries, sorry. Yeah. Is, there, um, is there any thinking um, along transportation as a service where you sort of take that risk away of obsolescence and uh, so you're just sort of providing the solution as opposed to people having to, you know, take the deep, deep dive into the decision? So for, for us, I mean, we, we will offer uh, kind of a zero upfront cost and a monthly uh, fee they, they would pay. They would have to find the demand for the trucks. I mean, we're all, we just finance it, oh, not we, not on our balance sheet, but with our partners, as an example I just il earlier illustrated. They would, we would finance it over the life uh, with, with certain... Uh, Understanding what the residual what the residual value would be at the end of it, so it's al almost n no risk for them. What is the lifespan of a truck? What is the lifespan of a truck? It ranges so, with, in the diesel world, it's, it goes eight, ten, twelve years, e even longer sometimes. In in our world, in the battery, eight years, ten years is right, but then there's you potentially have to replace a battery at the end of that life. Just and that's the, the life of the asset till it's like totally at end of life. Most fleets will get rid of their asset after like four to five years, move, sell it to another fleet, and they'll buy new buy trucks. New yeah. So these trucks move hands. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think we're getting the cane to pull us off stage here. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists uh, for, for coming, and uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone.